You hope you enjoyed intermission? I did! <laughs> Welcome to the polarizing half of our program. Uh, we ask that you remember to re-silence your cell phones because our debaters like to be the loudest thing in the room. <laughs> Alright, first up we have our extemp speech which we announced earlier. And this is, again, remember the topic is our social media outlets unfairly targeting conservatives. So now I welcome to the stage Jack Walsh. Woo! <laughs> In November of 2016, after the election of Donald Trump, Richard Spencer, was the keynote speaker at the National Policy Institute, a conservative think group, think tank, and organization. In this speech, he criticized liberals like Obama and Clinton and espoused the virtues of the Trumpian doctrine. This speech got a little bit heated and culminated in cries of Heil Trump and the Sig Heil salute from Spencer and members of the audience. This was taped as speeches of these nation, nature often are, and Richard Spencer received quite a lot of backlash from both sides for these actions. In response, he took the pose most comfortable to the modern conservative. One, he claimed that it was ironic, that it was just a joke. Can't you take a joke? Two, he said that he was being unfairly victimized by a liberal-controlled democratic media. This is common for these kinds of conservatives, uh, conservatives and is continued and seen throughout all of modern culture. The issue with conservatism is that it is an inherently violent ideology. Groups like Black Lives Matter have recently been recognizing and attempting to rectify their own persecution. This has led white dudes like Richard Spencer to reach the conclusion that victimhood is in vogue. And playing the victim is a popular and fun thing to do. It's what everyone's doing. Why not me? The issues with, conservat with conservatives and the reason that we ask questions like, is social media unfairly targeting conservatives, is that they fail to recognize that conservatism is a fundamentally violent ideology, that it fundamentally leads to violence. But how does it fundamentally lead to violence? The first thing that we need to talk about is the two types of violence. Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek posits two types of violence, subjective and objective. Subjective violence is the sort of violence that you can see, like theft or arson. There's clearly someone being harmed. There's clearly someone doing the harming. Objective violence is more subtle. Objective violence is the kind of violence inherent to power structures like capitalism. It's inherent to hate speech, which retrench, ultimately, which retrench institutions. Institutions like the military, like police, like the government. The problem here is that the state has a monopoly on what violence is, which is why arson is seen as violent, while, for example, denying tens of millions of people health care isn't. Conservatives engage in fundamentally violent speaking and thought through their actions. What we need to recognize is how social media and conservatives' actions on social media play into these sorts of violence. Conservatives espouse this violent ideology through social media outlets in order to oppress or express the institutional and the righteousness of the institutional oppression of women, of black people. Conservatives took to, conservatives took to Twitter to decry who was it? Leslie Jones, ultimately forcing her to delete her Twitter account. When some of their Twitter accounts were deleted because they called Leslie Jones racial slurs, they claimed this was a violation of their free speech rights, playing the victim yet again. They're playing the victim because they are the perpetrator of a crime and have nowhere else to go. They target queer folk. I went on a conservative, I went on Reddit just uh, like 20 minutes ago, and the first thing that I saw was something saying, I'm sure glad that we live in Trump's America because in Canada, they passed a law that forces you to respect people's gender pronouns. These kinds of problems are inherent to conservative media and lead to the kinds of violence. But what causes this violence in the first place? 
The issue with this violence is the idea espoused by neoliberal democracy of tolerance and of contention. It is theorized that there are two sides, that each side can have their opinion, and that while we, can, while we don't have to accept the opinion of the other side, we must respect the other side's ability to make that. The issue here, as Zizek points out, is that this ideology is fundamentally alienating. We otherize people on the other side in accepting but rejecting that which they have to say. And this leads to violence in the point of contention when one side goes too far. The modern conservative movement, older conservatives, Orrin Hatch says, is not shouting Heil Trump at a neoconservative rally. The modern conservative movement is better than that, Orrin Hatch being a segregationist. The issue here is that when we have these points of contention, this necessarily leads to otherization between groups of people. And when they cross that line, we say that, that's violent. They did that, that's wrong. But the problem is that it's the system that's violent. The system which allows these points of contention to occur necessitates the kind of violence that we see today. Which is why we need to do, as Slavoj Žižek says, we need to inaugurate a new left. One which is not based in the ideals of normativity, of tolerance, of institutions. We need to break away from the biopolitical institutions which entrench and reinforce harmful norms and oppression against a slew of people, anyone that isn't a white dude. We need to recognize that these institutions are negative, break away from these institutions. We need to break away from institutions because only if we break away from these institutions can we have a break away from objective and subjective violence. So if you ask, are conservatives being unfairly targeted on social media? What you need to be asking is what makes conservatives think that they're being unfairly targeted on social media? How can we make them think that they're not being unfairly targeted on social media? What role do institutions play in the maintenance of social media and the targeting of conservative and social media? We need to break away. We need to break away from objective violence. We need to think. We need to dissent. We need to talk. And we need to act. We need a new left. Thank you.
Okay, I would now like to turn it over to Caleb as he will introduce the debaters for tonight's debate. This will be a shift in tone real quick. Um, so, I'd like you to make noise for each of the debaters as they come out. On the affirmative side, first up, it's a 5'9", 80-pound senior who applied to every Ivy League school he'd heard of and at least two he hadn't. Please welcome, Albert Hoon! Received IQ boots. Please welcome DHS Speech and Debate's very own blonde joke, Elise Turkovic. Oh On the negative, we have a six foot seven junior who puts the con in conservative. It's the man who has more control over the round than he wants the government to have over him. Please welcome Blaine Clay.
Given the ease at which homicide can be committed with a handgun, as opposed to knives, handguns may well be the factor which transforms a heated argument into a lethal attack. The simple option of running away will be available far more often in the case of these other kinds of attacks than in the case of a handgun attack, the most likely source of handgun murder, ordinary citizens. In fact, guns are a major factor in intimate partner violence, according to Everytown Research. In an average month, 50 American women are shot to death by intimate partners. Today, nearly one million women alive have been shot. Abusers use guns to threaten and control their victims. And even worse, guns are directly linked to a massive increase in suicides. A 2008 study by Harvard University explains. Analysis of all 50 US states reveals a powerful link between rates of firearm ownership and suicides. In states where guns were prevalent, rates of suicide was higher. The inverse was also true. Where gun ownership was less common, suicide rates were also lower. The Violence Policy Center quantifies that people living in a household with a gun are five times more likely to die by suicide than people living in a gun-free home because it gives them an open avenue to suicide. In addition, six out of every 10 suicides is committed by a gun, equating to 90,000 deaths a year. For all these reasons, Elisa and I are proud to affirm today's resolution. Thank you. Rosenthal writes for the New York Times in December of 07. 
A comprehensive global study of abortion has concluded that abortion rates are similar in countries where it's legal and countries where it's not, suggesting that outlawing the procedure does little to deter the women who seek it. The law does not influence a woman's decision to have an abortion, but the legal status of abortion did greatly affect the dangers involved. Where abortion is legal, it will be provided in a safe manner. Where it is illegal, it is likely to be unsafe, performed under unsafe conditions by poorly trained providers. Here's the key. There's no room to speculate whether the failures of prohibition would be different for guns. Cook, Ludwig, and Braga write in 2007. Underground gun markets have developed in the United States in response to federal regulations that seek to prohibit ownership and possession of firearms. A few jurisdictions, including Chicago, go further and essentially prohibit the private possession of handguns. Economists like to point out that government prohibitions on transactions are difficult to enforce. The ingenuity of the marketplace motivated by profit will overcome whatever legal obstacles are put in place. As New York University law professor James Jacobs observes in this regard, some criminals claim that it's easy to buy, easier to buy a gun on the streets than it is to buy food. Chicago's handgun ban demonstrates that it was ineffective in reducing the prevalence of gun ownership in the city, suggesting that a ban on guns would not affect the amount of people who purchase and own guns in the United States. Not only that, but prohibition would only further discrimination against minorities. In 2014, Bradley Balco writes in the Washington Post that, quote, 47.3% of those convicted for federal gun crimes were black, a racial disparity larger than any class of federal crimes, including drug, time, including drug crimes. In a 2011 report, the U.S. Sentencing Commission found that African Americans were far more likely to be charged and convicted of federal gun crimes that carry mandatory minimum sentences. They were also more likely to be hit with enhancement penalties that added to their sentence. Furthermore, a ban on firearms would only further this discrepancy as it would criminalize those simply possessing and transporting hand firearms. The Washington Post furthers by stating that a firearms ban would only lead to targeting people who possess, sell, or transport guns reasonably, and that the selection of who and how to heavily to prosecute is dependent on the biases of the prosecutors. Rather than solving crimes, we see law enforcement agencies actively seeking out and targeting racial minorities in attempts to encourage in an attempt to encourage them to commit a crime, upon which they are then trapped into long prison sentences. A firearm ban would only perpetuate the cycle and reinforce structural racism. For these two reasons, Kenneth and I strongly negate today's resolution.
You I have, think that in the status quo, we have laws that effectively enforce gun control. Can I have a question? Sure. Okay, let's go, let's go over this idea about the criminal black market, right? The idea that, um, let's say, people right now, people of color, are targeted um, in the criminal justice system. Sure. Is this unique to just guns, or is this true across the board? Let's say with drugs, alcohol, across the board, um, people sure. of color are targeted. I, I understand right? the question. So the card from the Washington Post in 2014 says, 47.3% of those convicted for federal gun crimes were black. A racial disparity larger than any other class of federal crimes, including drug crimes. Okay. Suggesting that this is a particular outlier in terms of uh, sentencing disparities. But you agree that as a whole, right now in the country, people of color are hurt across the board with any law, right? Not just gun laws. Sure, so let's not make it worse by banning guns. Okay. Another life ended in crossfire. <laughs> oh! Because it is simply true that we live in a world of racial discrimination. 
discrimination, and that should not stop us from actually leading forward to more change. So overall, when we look to Australia, their own prime minister said, we don't want to go down the American path. That is why they implemented a ban on, um, a ban or a strong stringent of restrictions on guns. We, America, has literally our progressive laws are a horror story for the international community. For those reasons, we should be trying to create change, and you should vote affirmative.
what I mean. Like, Wait, you like, say that no, way. Okay, okay, so what I say is that like there are like potential laws that are either in place or that we could implement that actually like solve for the issues you do. Sure, there are plenty of current laws that could do something, but none of them do because they're not enforced and they're not taken up properly. So why would we vote for the quo? What's so I'm okay, I'm confused. <laughs> you say that there are laws in place that can deter mass shootings. Yeah, I say that there are systems. And then you talk about how you're ineffective. Solved. No, okay. I talk about like how when they fail, we see these tragedies happen. But when they don't fail, like they don't happen. Did you bring up any scenarios where they don't fail? No, that was the answer. So there are <laughs> <laughs> are effective. So why does that mean we don't do the effective? Like, why the reason, that okay, the reason I'm making this argument is that like it's not that the current gun laws aren't effective, but it's the fact like the people who are enforcing them are arguably ineffective. Okay, so, do so like if you, if do you make this gun law, like people, you're not going to be changing people. Do you have them. evidence saying that they would become more effective or that they could become more effective? Wouldn't that be arguing for your side? No. Like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can look another question. <laughs>
If we had a gun ban, people would not be able to buy these guns so easily. These people who committed the crime wouldn't be able to just go out in the store and buy guns. Remember, they say in their case that essentially there's an underground gun market, but the underground gun market is only for hardened criminals. We tell you that ordinary people are committing these crimes. 80% of gun violence is committed by ordinary people. That means if we have a gun ban, at the very least, we stop this 80% of crime, even if we don't stop at all. Furthermore, Let's move into this Australia evidence. Now, Kenny's buying into this fake news idea. He's saying, oh, I don't know where the source is. It's a little bit sus. We literally have a source from CNN. Are you going to say that CNN and the New York Times is all fake news? I think that's not true. I think it's real news. Let's move on. This Australia evidence is super, super critical. It tells you that when they ban guns, empirically, right, it's their nationally reported data. What happened is no more mass shootings happened, number one. Number two, homicides dropped by six by 65%, and number three, suicides dropped by 59%. This is an empirical study that's before and after. Once they banned guns, these were the results. Furthermore, um, he says that in the past when the US banned guns, it didn't do anything. However, this is true fake news. Because according to the Washington Post, in February in 2018, compared with the 10 year period before the assault rifle ban that we had before, the number of gun massacres during the number of gun massacres during the ban period fell by 37%, and the number of people dying from gun massacres in the US fell by 43%. But after the ban in the U.S. lapsed in 2004, the numbers shot up again, an astonishing 183% increase in massacres and a 239% increase in massacre deaths. That's directly after the assault rifles ban was taken out in 2004. This is from the Washington Post literally this year. Furthermore, you're going to extend our contention too. This is critical because it tells you that suicides are directly linked to guns, essentially the ease of availability of guns in the home allow people to kill themselves and it makes it so suicide rates go higher. The VPC specifically says that homes with guns are five times more likely to have suicide. Um, he cites that Japan, South Korea, and all these countries have higher suicide rates but no guns. But you can't make the direct comparison between Japan, South Korea, and the America because it's well known that Japan and South Korea, their suicide rates are because of their stress culture and academia, not a result of anything like guns or any of that. So in fact, you're going to buy the suicide evidence because it's directly from the BBC. And finally, he doesn't address this Harvard study. This Harvard study is critical because it examines 50 states across the US. And it tells you that in these 50 states across the U.S., in every single state where there were less guns, there was less violence. And in every single state where there were more guns, there were more violence. And so for all these reasons, I affirm today's resolution. Thank you. Why would a law-abiding senator 
hand over his or her weapon to the same authorities that did nothing to protect the children of Parkland? Why would a single law-abiding gun owner, gun owner turn over his or her capacity for self-defense to people who were incapable of defending children at every step of the way? Children are dead, not because of millions of good citizens owning AR-15s, but because dozens of pathetic incompetents and cowards in a position to do something instead did nothing. That should put it to rest. That should put the mass shooting to rest. But in case, in case, like we, we didn't we didn't talk enough about the mass shooting card. So that's a really important card. So we're going to talk more about it. There, there are several common threads amongst mass shooters that allow us to, to know that they're about to commit a mass shooting, they're about to engage in mass violence before it happens. The Washington Post reports on September 14, 2017. What is clear, however, is that regardless of ideological motivation or even in the complete absence of any such drive, these kind of attacks are usually presaged by some clear warning sign. Most people who commit seri serious crimes, that's not where they begin. They didn't just start committing gun crimes such as spouses or co-workers, they're often profoundly alienated from society. The Virginia baseball shooter threatened his daughter with a knife, punched his neighbor in the face, and struck his neighbor boy neighbor's boy boyfriend with a shotgun before firing around at the man as he fled. The Pulse nightclub shooter routinely beat his wife, threatened his co-workers, and could barely hold down a job. Even shooters without violent history such as Charleston, Isla, Isla Vista, or Virginia Tech were known by friends, family, or teachers to make disturbing threats and had drawn, uh, withdrawn from social life. What this tells you, right, is there are these plain indicators in the status quo already that we need to enforce. Yes, they're not being enforced, and that's exactly the problem. But if you want them to be enforced, the solution isn't to vote in favor of mass confiscation of guns. It's to ask police, police officers and law enforcement to do their job. So, on to the rest of their case. They talk about gun violence. And then we talk about, we talk about different countries. And they accuse us of using this, like, South Korea, this South Korea argument. Like, South, we can't talk about South Korea and Japan. But we can. We can compare South Korea and Japan to the United States. And what's really funny, what's really important to know, is they say that we, that like, we can't, like, we're, tr we're trying to analyze Australia and the United States, right? And then they come up here and they criticize us for analyzing South Korea and Japan. Tell us we can't do it. Absolutely ridiculous. Japan, South Korea, and their suicide rates are both subject to debate and subject to scrutiny during today's rally. So we, t we have to talk about, like, 1994 and, and the, uh, the gun ban in 1994, right? So they talk about how it actually prevented mass shootings and prevented gun violence, but we need to read what the National Institute of Justice, who issued the report after the 1994 gun violence collapse, they, they analyze, they tell you that Subtitle A, the Public Safety and Recreational Firearms Use Protection Act of the Act, banned the manufacture, transfer, uh, and acquisition museums, assault weapons, large capacity ammunition museum, and magazines. The Attorney General of the United States goes on to conclude, we cannot clearly credit the ban with any of the nation's recent drop in gun violence. Should it be renewed, the, ban, the ban's effects on gun violence are likely to be small at best. And even then, they talk about statewide. They, they cite this Harvard study where they talk about like several different states, right? But you have to consider David B. Kopel's analysis at the Cato Institute when he tells you that Connecticut has had such a ban on firearms since 1993. Economist John Lott explained the data for five states with assault weapon bans in his 2003 book, The Bias Against Gun. A bias against guns. Controlling for sociological variables, he found no evidence of reduction in crime. To the contrary, the bans were associated with increased crime in some categories. State level data does not support the claim that assault weapon bans reduce crime rates. So what we see across the board, guys, is they, they start with this, this contention about mass shootings and this appeal to emotion, but they fail to neglect that in the status quo, there are indicators, there are things that indicate that a mass shooting is going to happen, and we need to look at those before we punish collectively law-abiding gun owners who are not responsible for mass shootings. That's our key response to their, second, their first contention. Then our second one is about dangerous ownership and gun ownership. But then we tell you the CDC, okay, Obama CDC, they try to come up here and tell you that the CDC study is biased from a conservative point of view, but the CDC was commissioned by Obama. Not only that, but it was not only commissioned by Obama, and yes, it did involve David Kleck, but it involved many other studies. So for them to try to refute the CDC card, which is really, really good, it takes into account other studies. Other studies. It's a consensus study. And for these reasons, we strongly urge a vote in favor of the negation during today's debate. Today, the more guns, less crime hypothesis by law has been thoroughly repudiated. 
On closer inspection, his impressive credentials reveal an academic nomad, never able to secure a place in academia. His ethical transgressions range from fabricating an entire survey to presenting faulty regressions to creating an elaborate online persona to defend his work and bash critics. So you're saying this is a good author? No, we're saying David E. Coke with the Cato Institute is a good author. Okay, and David cites John Locke, correct? Okay, here's, okay, first off, like, yes, that right. sounds really like you, okay? Second off, like, <laughs> second off like, if we want to go down that route, like, we can question, like, who, like, who said this, right? Like, who made this argument? But I feel like you're just picking hairs, like, splitting hairs where they shouldn't be, like, splitting hairs. I mean, the whole idea. And, and what's important to understand is that, like, even if you deny, like, David Kogel and John Locke's evidence at a statewide level, you still have to answer for the Attorney General of the United States and the National Institute of Justice when they tell you that at a federal nationwide level, the 1994 ban was ineffective. Would you like a question? Sure, I'll take the question. Actually, what, what are you going to ask us another question? That's pretty entertaining. Sure. So, <laughs> I will, I'll ask you a question. So, you say that South Korea and Japan, it's like, you're, it's, the criticism we made of that is the same as the one of Australia, correct? Uh, essentially, but there are other there are other criticism of South Korea and Japan was that you have a shaky link between suicide and the actual cause of a gun ban, whereas in Australia it was empirical analysis before and after the ban. So okay. That's a okay. Key so here's here's the answer to this question. It's like you really don't like us to cite like South Korea and Japan for whatever reason. No, okay? it, no, you can cite South Korea and Japan if you said that a gun ban or like a gun ban no, okay. had no effect on like on no, suicide. I, I but you're okay. not having okay. a link okay. between gun bans and no, suicide. There's a problem with your Australia like analysis, right? Like in the Australia analysis, it doesn't actually like, the reason why our evidence conflicts is because your evidence doesn't actually take into the fact that there's other factors other than the gun ban that reduce okay, the amount so of guns. So it just happened that once they banned guns, there was no yeah, more actually, like, literally, we tell, tell you in our evidence that, that like, we, we tell you our evidence. evidence. I don't think okay, there's any actual. Let's take a step no, back. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which comes to the same conclusion that not only do Japan and South Korea, they have a ban on guns and they have high suicide rates, okay. but the same is true of Poland, Germany, Austria, okay. and other countries. <laughs> okay. Do South Korea and Japan have a stress culture? Sure. Do, does Poland, Germany, Australia, and the United we, Kingdom do have a stress culture? Do we have a stress culture? Like, that's a really good question. Empirically, <laughs> Japan, <laughs> South Korea, these countries no, are looking at this I want to know what you're asking. Right. Ask yes, I would like to answer the question. I, oh, sorry, yes. I would like to ask a question. <laughs> Could you explain to me, you criticize the Japan and South Korea evidence, right? But you don't consider the fact that the World Health Organization tells you that Hungary, Poland, France, Belgium, and Austria have higher suicide rates than the United States and all have stricter gun control regimes. Like, how do you answer sure. that? Sure. I would say that still is only correlation, and there's no way you make that directly. Okay, wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. You have no, 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 no. You have one You have Australia as your example. I have eight different countries. Okay. Whereas Australia has a clear causal link between 
between why a ban on guns led to a decrease in violence. Next, um, the second point is that um, they bring up this idea about how the U.S. was, there was no, de when the U.S. banned assault rifles, there was no decrease in violence. However, one, their study, uh, mis as we brought up in cross-examination, uses an author that was very flawed and frowned upon in the academic community. Additionally, he brought up evidence that was not responded to from, I believe, the Washington Post said that when there was an assault ban rifle in the United States, there was a 30% seven, 37 decrease, percent decrease in gun um, massacres, meaning that we clearly do have empirics onto why a ban in the United States had real results. Next, um, they say that status quo gun laws are ineffective and they're not enforced. But the claim that they're trying to make here is that we can just enforce them better. You can't just enforce laws better. You can't just fiat that an entire nation will suddenly start enforcing these gun laws that are, have been proven time and time again to be ineffective. This is why you need a ban on guns because enforcement is not good and we simply need to outright ban it to create a change. Additionally, um, you can extend the point about um, intimate partner violence and decrease suicides. There's very clear evidence from Harvard University which says that there was a decrease in suicides. And um, that clearly shows to you why if we were to simply take away guns from these um, average people, they were, or we are able to actually decrease suicides and decrease violence. Additionally, next, um, another huge, um, some huge voter issues in today's debate, they bring up prohibition. However, again, you can cross-apply the evidence about how their evidence was flawed and how it didn't take a correct sample size and how prohibition is, um, there are, in Australia, it was very clearly empirical that it can be done. And lastly, they bring up how guns save lives. There is no empirics to back this up. It's, our evidence shows that 99% of people, even if they buy a gun, don't use it to do anything. And in the Parkland shooting, there was a police officer on site who had a gun and nothing was done. When people buy guns, it simply leads to more violence because they either don't know how to use it or they get angered and start using it in negative ways. A ban on guns would have clear decreases in violence, decreases in death, and betterment of all of American lives. For those reasons, I um, affirm the resolution. <laughs> Canadian singer Justin Bieber once asked, is it too late to say sorry? And honestly, for their case, it's way too late. Let's look at the fact that, like, during the case, so the main, like, argument over this is basically, like, whose evidence proves better, or whose evidence is more, like, 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 somehow better, and somehow, like, we as, like, high school debate students just somehow know if their specific methodology and their specific way they actually created this evidence. But, again, look to the fact that, like, the reason why their studies say, like, there's a decrease in gun violence, there's a decrease in, like, mass shootings or homicides after a gun ban, and our studies say that there's no substantial, like, evidence of that happening from both the Attorney General and multiple studies, the reason why like, our studies prove are much better is because they take into the fact that correlation does not mean causation. They take into the fact that there's other sociological factors that, de that like, could lead to a decrease in gun violence or decrease in gun homicides or mass, like, um, mass shootings. So insofar as like, they don't actually prove, like, they don't like, delve into the topic themselves, but they, they criticize us for doing so, you cannot buy their evidence. Again, our evidence takes into account that there's other factors as well, like theirs is just not as comprehensive. But furthermore, look to the fact that our first contention, they talk about like, um, they say that like, oh, only 99% of people actually use these guns, but that's like a good thing, right? They shouldn't be using all these guns, but rather like the 1% that's actually using these guns are actually saving, like, you know, <coughs> doing, leading the 3 million people that are actually saved that we proved to you in, the, in our case, and they don't actually refute this directly. They just say that like only 99% of people who buy a gun or own a gun, like actually use them. That doesn't like, those things aren't mutually exclusive. Again, you can still buy the fact that guns actually do save lives, and they do save lives much more than they actually harm people. Like, but furthermore, like don't forget that our second contention, which is really key, because there's two major points. First off, when you pro like when you pro like ban something, including alcohol, including drugs, including abortion in different countries, like when you do that, that doesn't actually lead to a decrease in the amount of people who actually use it or like uh, who actually buy it or use it or try to attain it. All you're gonna do is like make it so that people who are trying to attain those things can only do so illegally. And when we see that in um, we when we apply that to guns, we're only going to be seeing people doing that through an illegal, like, underground crime market. And so I think that, like, insofar as, like, they only say that, like, um, insofar as, like, their, their response to that is not strong enough, don't buy the fact, because, again, no matter what, like, we've seen history, like, historical evidence proves, like, that when you do this sort of action, when you do some sort of prohibition, especially that resolution which bans guns outright, like, that's just not going to achieve the results that you actually want. And then, like, let's just talk about, like, their first and second contention. Again, they talk about, like, 67% of, like, murder victims, or, uh, 
the, due to Hamas, like gun homicides, and they talk about like uh, how the Australian mass shootings. Again, we prove to you that there's if you do this gun ban, if you pass the resolution right now, there's going to be no change in that because again, there's no reason why that out would actually change. They say that like current laws, or, like current gun laws, don't actually work well because the law enforcement doesn't work. Again, you're not changing the law enforcement; you're just changing the number of laws that you're putting in and like restricting the rights of legal citizens. So insofar as like you're not changing the law enforcement like personnel, you're not going to be changing how they enforce these laws. These laws are still going to be ineffective. And furthermore, like domestic violence and suicide, they don't actually address this. They say, like, they say they refer to Australia, we refer to Japan, South Korea, Hungary, Poland, and Austria, and those definitely prove that, like, like suicide rates don't actually correlate well with the like, gun ownership. And furthermore, domestic violence, again, we prove to you that, like, if you ban guns, you're not going to be reducing the cause of uh, domestic violence. All you're going to be reducing is, like, the amount of people who, like, illegal or, illegally are being asked access guns, but again, we tell you with current laws and, like, other laws that actually just limit people who are domestic abusers from getting laws in the first place, like, which makes sense, that actually decreases the amount of people who are being hurt by domestic abusers. So insofar as like this gun ban is just not making any sense, won't actually cause anything, and it's way too overreaching in terms of like harming the rights of American citizens, you should not vote for this resolution. Thank you. Tonight, you're all the judges. So, uh, I'd like to hear from you all which side you think won. So, first, make some noise if you think the AF team here won. <laughs> and the NEG team, make some noise if you think. Like, very last minute. But, <laughs> see, 
when we came here, like when we started organizing things, we realized that Miss Nagnoth had pretty much like done most of the work already, and we didn't have a lot to do. And so, like this event ran so smoothly, smoothly, and like went so well because of her. And so we wanted to give a big hand to her for like making this whole thing possible. and then you can disperse. Um, first, if you want a silent auction item, there are sticky notes, I've been told, on the list or on the items. You should make sure to pay for the item if you want the item um, in the lobby. And then second, there's still pizza. It's 50 cents a slice. If you want to bring food home for your Two midnight snack. Two slices for a dollar. Two slices for a dollar. don't have change. Okay, so bring two slices of pizza home. It's real cheap, it's real good. Um, I think that's all for announcements. Thank you all so much for coming and supporting us.